there's a perception out there, and people will cite selective facts and evidence to forward this point of view. It's the point of view that the problem with immigration is a problem of perception. And that it's not really a problem. It's a problem in the minds of people who choose to decide that they think it's a problem based on the information that they take in. Now, aside from the fact that that's a very arrogant way to look at it and that you could say the same about any problem, uh, because so many of the issues in life that we experience are about how they make us feel these days. People will cite the net economic gain of immigration as evidence that people who feel insecure about it, their concerns are not rooted in any sort of verifiable evidence. But see, these same people are always going on about trickle-down economics being a sham and neoliberal agenda being a sham. So how can they cite economic data as evidence? Well, they have a whole other argument that's about the economy being a sham. The point is, the economic benefits of migration are very rarely felt by the communities that disproportionately experience migration, or immigration, sorry. So, so what's being experienced at that ground level is a feeling of consistent transition. Now this is a community, these are communities where we already have the science that shows that chronic stress and poverty, people's brains develop differently. So where people from a middle class, more affluent background, where people are a lot calmer and have the emotional wherewithal to absorb strain, they can deal with things. Their brain interprets the, the world around them as information, as obstacles to be traversed. But in these other communities, these poorer communities that see wave and after wave of immigration coming in, People's brains actually form differently. That's what a lot of this Glasgow effect study was around. And so people who are dealing with the chronic stress of poverty and the associated conditions health-wise, they experience life as noise. This is why they are less likely to push themselves to, uh, to, to go beyond their comfort zones. This is why they're likely to turn to self-defeating stress management strategies like smoking or drinking or eating uh, high calorie nutrient void food these are all behaviors that are rooted in stress management that are often misunderstood by people of higher classes uh, who who don't have a visceral perspective on what it's like to to feel stressed that, that, that a position of stress and dread is the normality. You expect to be poor. You expect to be stressed. You expect life to be difficult. And so your only escapes from that banality are to do things that will hasten your death. These are the communities where the immigrants are going. Now, if we want to pay more than lip service to giving immigrants the best possible chance, why are we sending them to chronically stressed communities, first of all, right? This is the first instance. Why are they always getting sent in to communities that are undereducated in comparison to the more affluent communities in society? Communities that are under-resourced, communities that receive a disproportionate level of cuts to services in, in the age of austerity. I mean, it's kind of typified by, if you go around to Govan Hill, there's a private school right on the edge of Govan Hill and there's a big sign outside it that says, Stop Prejudice, right? Now that school is completely insulated from the reality of Govan Hill because it's a private school. It's just a bubble in the middle of Govan Hill. And there's an example of that sort of talking down to the other people that are around you. 
when you can talk from a pos position of privilege. Uh, so that's the first instance, right? If we want to give people from Eastern Europe or Africa or war zones a good start, then why aren't we spreading them among uh, all of the communities of Glasgow or Scotland? Like, do you ever see them going to the West End? Do you ever see people being integrated into the West End of Glasgow, which is the city's most affluent community? Uh, area. Of course you don't. Of course you don't. So that's one aspect, right? Now, the other aspect is the people who are living in these communities who lack the sort of lexicon that we all take for granted when we discuss their lives, like they aren't part of the conversation. They're living in economic conditions of humiliation. I worked with a guy when I was doing my community disposal, a community payback order, and it was a church, and he was working there full time, full time hours, 35 hours a week, and he was getting paid £70 a week, so it was 140 quid a fortnight he was getting. This guy turned up to work on time every day, walked right to the end of his shift, did not take a break. This guy couldn't find a job. He couldn't find a job. And his primary concerns in life were football and incidents that were going on in his community that he was attributing to foreigners. Incidents like a child sex ring, um, genital mutilation, children being abused, uh, arranged marriages. Now, while... You can certainly argue that he might end up thinking in unhelpful generalities around these issues. Let's just take a minute to imagine life from the perspective of the guy or the woman that we are accusing of racism. They're living in a chronically stressed community. We know from the science that their brains have formed differently and interpret the world in a much more cautious manner. And so... Can we at least accept that we can understand how some people arrive at a position where unable to express their grievance and fear around wave after wave of immigration into their already extremely challenged community by us no being able to engage with them and listen to them without making a value judgment we contribute to delivering them to the open arms of someone like Farage, who talks in a very kind of, I feel your pain sort of way. I'm not apologising for fascists. I think the fascists are at the, op are, are at the far end of the spectrum. I don't think people who vote UKIP, which is a populist nationalist party, I don't pe think people who vote UKIP are necessarily racist. But this idea that it's a perception problem that they have and that we need to educate them that immigration isn't a problem just shows a complete lack of understanding of the dynamics at play. Imagine someone saying, I mean, I, 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 I can see the incredulity in my mind already if a similar argument was made about patriarchy or if a similar argument was made, you know, about any one of these things, these social justice uh, issues um, if someone says no well, that, that's actually in your head that, uh, that's actually in your head because all the evidence shows you know that the, the gender pay gap is such and such and all the evidence shows that, that uh, women are equal and you know sorry uh, darling but you just need to educate yourself on reality like that just wouldn't fly that wouldn't fly at all Um. And I think I, people might say it's a false equivalence. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to reframe it in a way that will make you angry, so that you understand how this person feels. And I feel like this is a valid exploration of these ideas to say, okay, let's engage with the social, political, cultural, emotional context that creates the fertile ground for 
attitudes that could lead to racism, right? It's it's a feeling of not being heard. It's it's living in conditions of economic humiliation, right? Right? At least that's how it seems to me. So I don't think it's going to fly that we say, oh no, well, there's no problem with immigration because there's a net economic gain. And we say that on one hand. Well, we also cite that trickle-down economics is a sham, that our economy is broken. The economic gain is not felt by the communities that receive disproportionate amounts of migrants. And that if we want to give these migrants the best possible chance at a new life, then we need to consider distributing migrants in a much more intelligent and thoughtful and sophisticated manner. And that this might mean people who make big proclamations about immigration should be prepared to open the doors of their own homes in their mostly Caucasian affluent communities. You know what I mean? Anyway, thanks for all the engagement so far. Go and check out the blog, locallyscottishrapper.com. There is lots of different content up there interrogating different aspects of social justice, left-wing politics, lots of different types of provocations, including ones like this where it's just thinking through stuff. So I'm really grateful for all of the engagement. I recognise that this is challenging for some of my friends on the left in Scotland. And I recognise that some other people um, may completely disagree with me. The point is to try and just let all of that feed into the various content that comes along in the future. And, and, and by the end, maybe come through this as a changed person and be able to express and communicate that to the people that have been watching, who I'm sure, through what I can gather, are, are feeling the similar levels of moral confusion that I'm currently feeling based on all of the events that's happening and how social media amplifies that in our lives. So, go and check out the blog, locallyscottishrapper.com, and I'll, I'll catch you soon. <laughs>